Good evening. My name is Amy Lizer, and I'm the Executive Director of the Monroe County Historical Association, and I'm happy to welcome you to our monthly Third Thursday Lecture Series. I'm very happy to introduce our speaker tonight, meteorologist Ben Gelber, joins us. He forecasts the weather for NBC4 and prepares science and environmental study stories. He earned an Emmy for Best Weather Anchor and several nominations and received honorable mention for the AP Best Regularly Scheduled Weathercast. He's been recognized by NOAA for more than 20 years of service as a voluntary cooperative observer. Last year, Ben celebrated his 40th year at WCMH-TV. Ben is an adjunct professor at Ohio State University in meteorology. He participates in the National Weather Service Franklin County Weather Spotter Training Program. Ben regularly visits Central Ohio schools to give weather presentations and moderates academic panels on air quality, health, and climate relationships. Ben holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Penn State University and a Master's degree in Meteorology from Northern Illinois University. He was awarded the American Meteorological Society's Seal of Approval and inducted into the East Stroudsburg Hall of Fame. He credits his father, a U.S. Army Air Corps veteran and college English professor, for introducing him to the study of cloud formations and aviation weather in elementary school. Ben has published several weather books, including the Pennsylvania Weather Book and Pocono Weather, numerous science articles that have appeared in magazines and newspapers. Ben forecasts weather conditions for major outdoor events, such as the Red, White, and Boom, Picnic with the Pops, the Columbus Symphony, Lancaster Festival, concerts, county fairs, and movies filmed in Central Ohio. He has been also called upon to interpret forensic weather data for law enforcement. Ben and his wife, Michelle, reside in Hilliard, Ohio, and they have three sons. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my delight and pleasure to welcome Ben, who's joining us all the way from Ohio, to give us his presentation, Weather Predictions and Climate Change. Thank you so much, Ben, for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Amy, and uh, welcome to uh, everyone uh, this evening, enjoying a, a, a totally seasonable September day. Makes and, sense, makes sense. Now, I did want to mention that um, there is a, a Q&A function at the bottom of people's screens for our viewers. So if you have questions throughout Ben's, Ben's talk, please go ahead and type your questions in, and when the presentation is over, I'll be happy, happy to ask them for you. Thank you very much. Uh, sure, Amy, thanks, Ben. And uh, all our uh, great folks at Monroe County Historical Association, um, who I've had an association with uh, going back uh, decades uh, on my trips home to do historical research, which uh, is so important uh, in not, not just in terms of local history, which is fascinating, but for me to get a sense of how much or if the weather has really changed and what more Interestingly, uh, what perceptions were, say, in the 1800s of uh, when the weather was wacky, and uh, and I'll I'll make a few comments along the way as I remember some of the things that I've uncovered in the uh, early uh, and middle 19th century uh, Monroe County newspapers. Um, of course, I was doing it the old-fashioned way on microfilm for years and decades, uh, way, starting way back at Kemp Library. Uh, before the new library at uh, when it was then ESSC, now ESU. So um, yeah, and just briefly, the reason why I, I, I love talking about Pocono weather is, as Amy mentioned, I grew up in East Stroudsburg, but lived briefly in Stroudsburg, but grew up in East Stroudsburg. So essentially K through 12, or as I like to say, K through Penn State, um, <laughs> to include the, co the uh, college years that followed. Uh, this was my first and only job. Um, uh, I, with NBC in Columbus uh, doing the weather on air. And, but I uh, came home and still come home periodically uh, to visit family, friends, and uh, just to take in the mountains and the scenery and, and sometimes do a little more historical research locally, uh, which Amy has been so kind to help me with over the years. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit. We'll have time for Q&A and, and a few anecdotes. Um, 
the uh, picture on top of the screen or the lead picture uh, kind of introduces uh, the next season whenever it decides to show up and winter will eventually arrive. Um, it's one of my favorite pictures. Obviously, the weather was no picnic. Uh, if you're wondering, on this day, this would have been uh, March 14th of 2017. I was fortunate enough back-to-back -back years to have had a vacation uh, that coincided with a massive snowstorm in the Poconos and, and the Northeast. Uh, so I got to enjoy weather without having to worry about uh, forecasting or presenting. And then when the uh, snow let up, finally, uh, we had anywhere from 18 to 24 plus inches of snow. And this was a storm, uh, I believe, that brought uh, three feet of snow to areas along the New York-Pennsylvania border, uh, including Binghamton. Again, that would have been a week before the first day of spring in 2017. And you're looking at about two feet of snow here at uh, Resica Falls. Uh, so that kind of uh, gets us started. Um, so some of the things uh, that we look at, I'm gonna see if I can slide that down a little bit. Um, some of the things that we look at during the um, fall uh, would be the, the, the nature of uh, Pacific Ocean uh, climate patterns. So in this case, this would be a typical El Nino pattern. Now I'll mention in a moment, that's not the opposite of what we're gonna see this year. Um, and, uh, and a La Nina pattern. So we'll, we'll talk about those, but in a, in a La Nina pattern, uh, this is the uh, weather pattern that we had last year. The, in other words, the uh, jet stream or storm track. And this is the, uh, the cooler version or the opposite version of an El Nino. So this is a La Nina we're actually looking at since that this is the most likely configuration of the jet stream or steering currents for weather systems uh, for the upcoming winter. It's not absolute, it's just an average. So one thing that we will look at, and especially the Climate Prediction Center when forecasts are issued, uh, is uh, where will the jet stream most likely be based on past experiences with moderate La Niñas, including last year. And in those cases, you see the jet stream diving down uh, into the Midwest, but then starting to turn or north in the Ohio Valley. So on average, a La Nina winter, especially a moderate to strong La Nina, you sense that the coldest air is shunted a little bit north and west of our region, maybe into upstate New York, northern New England. Um, but because the, the likely uh, configuration would feature a blocking high pressure uh, south of the Aleutian Islands, uh, then as you go downstream, because it's like a uh, the jet stream connects uh, around the globe. And so what goes up must come down. So if you build a ridge into the Gulf of Alaska, uh, then the, then the uh, downward uh, portion of the jet stream is in the upper Midwest. And then it would tend to start to loop back north into the Northeast. So that would limit our cold blasts. Uh, but, uh, but this is again, an average. And what we saw last year is that during the middle of winter, uh, February, after a, a relatively mild winter, uh, the jet stream developed a much sharper curvature all the way down to the southern plains in the Gulf and then loop back north. So that allowed all this cold air to plow south. Texas had uh, historic cold waves and record-breaking consecutive snows uh, across the deep south. We had a very cold February. Uh, so that's why we say this is an average two out of three months this was kind of the pattern or the flow, but uh, there are other factors and that's something that we always keep in mind. All right, let's see if I can slide this up here. Um, so uh, again, the difference or the counterpart to La Nina, which is again what we're experiencing uh, last winter, this winter, which is in the bottom, would be El Nino. So uh, when I teach at OSU and when we talk about these, you know, obviously, okay, what's the difference? The first thing you see that's different with an El Nino versus a La Nina. So La Nina, you see dry, warm weather across the southern states, a wet pattern in the Ohio Valley, and an average precipitation, but a lack of nor'easters in the northeast, in the mid-Atlantic. That's the bottom view. So that would be the most likely outcome this winter if we're looking strictly at the Pacific Ocean be specific La Nina's cooler weather in the Pacific, Eastern Equatorial uh, Pacific Ocean. El Nino, the reverse, is warm water in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific. 
which changes the jet stream configuration. So up top, uh, and we have uh, an, a strong El Nino in 2015-16, but winters, if you hear uh, uh, El Nino, then you look for a reverse where you see the wetter, cooler weather in the southern states, warmer and drier weather across the north. So these are, if not mirror opposites, significantly different. Uh, you know, it, it's a big deal if, you, if you're in California and you're trying to get out of a drought, then you hope for an El Nino winter. And we know the West has had uh, a mega drought lasting over 20 years. A La Nina, unfortunately, and you, this has been mentioned in the news, uh, would, would potentially mean less rain during the wet season in the West. Um, but, but more importantly, the polar jet stream uh, is, is in a different position between these two. Now, that said, uh, some of our biggest snows have actually occurred in El Nino winters because while the polar jet stream generally dives south from near Hudson Bay in Canada to the northeast, it can also take a deeper dive along the east coast and uh, link up with just enough cold air to bring some pretty big snows. We tend to have fewer uh, significant snowfalls in a La Nina winter because the storm track is displaced or farther west. In other words, over the Appalachians or Ohio Valley. So those are just some basics. But again, that's just one uh, the Pacific uh, sea surface temperature is one variable among many, and other variables will come into play as the winter progresses. Now, while an El Nino or La Nina season, uh, or a neutral, which would mean uh, neither cold nor warm water above or below average temperatures, uh, is evident. So there's even a third option, of which all bets are off, and then there's not a great deal to glean from the Pacific immediately. So, but one thing that we've discovered, and I uh, wasn't really covering when I was in college as much, uh, we didn't fully grasp the Arctic Oscillation, which really seems to become a big player. Uh, that also, like El Nino and La Nina, which those cycles run one to two years, and then maybe a neutral year, and then we flip. Arctic Oscillation is much less predictable. Yeah, there, there are periods of time where it's more positive or more negative, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but but it can just develop in the middle of winter. It's not like you know going into a winter necessarily that you're going to have a particular phase of the Arctic Oscillation. So let's look at these two uh, options. Um, when you have on the left-hand side strong polar vortex winds, we we're familiar with the polar vortex, the coldest air in North America that sits uh, off to the edge of northeastern Canada, but it's an upper level feature. Uh, so it, it really ties in with the jet stream. A strong polar vortex pattern, uh, it, it creates like a fence. Uh, if you have strong winds, the cold air, the, the really frigid air is kind of fenced or hemmed in. Um, and it, the coldest air, when it does try to descend, doesn't get very far south. Northeastern Canada, and then uh, maybe shunted uh, off to the, to the east to toward uh, northern Europe. And so that's one, one possibility, and that can come and go during the course of a winter or the course of several years. Uh, so that's a, uh, a pretty good rule of thumb is that that's not going to deliver a, a harsh winter uh, in our neck of the woods. Uh, now, uh, on door number two on the right, a less strong uh, polar vortex circulation pattern, uh, weaker winds. So that creates bulges in the jet stream. In other words, um, the fence has some gaps in it. And when that happens, or at least uh, there's more give, uh, some of the cold air, as you can see on the right-hand side of the picture, uh, can descend southward. Often a, a, an actual lobe or piece of the polar vortex itself may break off and, and, and drift south. We've seen that actually several times in the past decade. And we certainly know what the weather's like when we get a piece of the polar, polar vortex. Uh, so determining which type of Arctic oscillation, um, either on the left, the positive phase, uh, or on the right, a, a negative phase. And, and a lot of this ties into the stratosphere. Uh, in other words, altitudes up around uh, 10 to 20 miles uh, because the polar vortex resides in the upper levels. Uh, you know, whether that descends or not. So those are, but that's not predictable. We have to wait and see. We could be sitting in the middle of a mild winter and then suddenly have um, a piece of the polar vortex come south, a change in the, what we call that Arctic oscillation. And the next thing you know, we flip from a, a very mild winter 
And this is essentially what happened last year into a extremely extraordinarily cold and snowy February. And then it, several weeks of that, and, and then we're back to where we were. So again, you can see it's a, and that, those, there are myriad variables. Those are just two of the major players. Um, this is uh, the house I grew up in, uh, at least um, my weather uh, years. Uh, in East Stroudsburg off Maple Avenue, one of my favorite pictures. Uh, this was at January of 2016. That was an El Nino winter. Uh, it was also mild. And I mentioned, oddly, both strong El Nino and La Nina winters tend to be on the warm side for different reasons, but uh, they both, um, the net result is that cold air is shunted away. We actually have our colder, snowier winters uh, either with a neutral Pacific season, neither warm nor unusually cold Pacific water, or a weaker version of one of those other two where it's, it's simply the Pacific uh, forcing is not that important. But the Atlantic forcing, the blocking in the Atlantic that sends cold air south, and that would be that negative Arctic oscillation, uh, becomes a, a more dominant. And that did happen right in the middle of 2015, 2016, in an extremely uneventful winter. Uh, if you remember on a Saturday, January 23rd, and I do, because I couldn't get, I came out for a visit and couldn't dig out my car. Uh, that's how the scenery looked on Maple Avenue in East Stroudsburg with a foot and a half of snow. Uh, and it was, for me, it was absolutely gorgeous. I loved every minute of it, except the shoveling. Now, there are many aspects of winter weather uh, that, uh, that can be extreme. Uh, we've talked about cold, which we tie in again, with the position of the jet stream and in the big picture, what phase of the Arctic oscillation we're in or what phase of the Pacific uh, pattern we're in. But across the board, we frequently run into a scenario where the Poconos sit right on the boundary between Arctic air that's partially blocked to the north. And we saw both in the examples I gave of La Nina and El Nino that are moderate to strong that the coldest air shunted either north or northwest. Um, but there's just enough cold air to trickle in. At the same time, you have an active uh, southern branch of the jet stream so that warm moist air overruns the cold air. And when that happens, you're cold enough at the ground for snow, but at cloud level, you're raining. And on January 6 to 9, 2005, courtesy of a meteorology uh, colleague, uh, in, in the region, uh, Mike Pontrelli. Uh, this is uh, Route 115 uh, in the west end or western portion of the Pocono Plateau. We had a disastrous ice storm that fell in, uh, hundreds, if not uh, more than a thousand degrees, uh, and, and that could be a problem. So, other uh, winter memories, uh, and this this was the beginning of the breakdown of the mild winter last year. We were sailing along. We had, yeah, we had some snow in December, a little bit in January, but temperatures were well above average until, uh, despite a La Nina pattern where you think, okay, we're we're in good shape, winter's we're going to ease out of winter. Then the negative phase of the Arctic oscillation, in other words, a blocking high in the Atlantic, built, uh, which became evident as early as the second week of January, uh, but that takes a while for the pattern to reconfigure. Suddenly, the jet stream was physically blocked from sweeping cold air off to our north, and then it buckled, and then the cold air came pouring into the midsection of the country and clashed with the, uh, uh, the, the res resilient and uh, remnant uh, warm air, mild air that had been hovering over us in January. That happened on the, at the very end of January and the first day of February. And this was one of those scenes uh, from another in a long series of large snow events that often occur in the transition. You may have an El Nino or La Nina, but you transition from a, uh, a more of a west to east flow to a blocking pattern north to south, and then curl it, and then north to south, and then the buckle brings storms south to north on the other end up the east coast. And we wound up with a historic 48 hour plus uh, snowstorm uh, that, as you may recall, I think by Groundhog Day had deposited another. 20 to locally 30 inches of snow. So uh, putting it all together, uh, these are uh, examples. Uh, you can have, and a clear example, you, in, in an otherwise mild winter, uh, you can have a severe ice storm in the upper left. Uh, this uh, was January 2005. 
you can have on the, again, my uh, folks place uh, and where I grew up on the, in the lower left, uh, a foot and a half of snow, two feet in the mountains in January, 2016 in an otherwise mild winter, which shows you how it can flip. But on the right, and this is different. This was a, the, uh, the polar vortex winter of 2013, 2014, when the term polar vortex came into our popular lexicon. I remember going on the air and explaining I, there was the initial social media pushback. Well, are we just inventing another term? I actually brought out a uh, an old meteorology textbook from the 1950s, uh, a glossary, and of course, and I knew I'd had polar vortex in, in college at Penn State, which talked about the term dating back to the late 1800s. Just it wasn't bandied about uh, in the media, uh, but in a true polar vortex winter, where uh, the, the negative Arctic oscillation, or in other words, the buckle and the jet stream holds uh, uh, more strongly, then you can really pile up the snow, not a fleeting one-off event, uh, but you can have in 2013, 2014, we had that deep blast of Arctic air in early January and 30 to 40 below wind chills, but then we piled up upwards of 40 inches of snow in February. And this was when the snow depth that my son took when he was staying at, at my folks' place about two feet of snow. Uh, but that was a winter that had staying power. That snow was still on the ground or most of it for a good portion of March. Uh, that's a case where uh, the, the colder flow or northwesterly flow in the jet stream prevailed most of the winter. And so rather than just a quick uh, hit. That brings us to precipitation overall. Uh, there have been, and I've just run some numbers and looked at some data, it's not our imagination that it's that we are flooding more often, that we're having more heavy rainfall events. All of this has been documented. Uh, clockwise, or excuse me, counterclockwise, I believe. No, clockwise from top left. Um, that would be the remnants of Ivan in, I believe it was uh, either August or September, I think September of 2004, uh, the, a storm that came out of the Gulf and actually did a complete 360 degrees and ended up back in the Gulf where the state got five to 10 inches of rain. Uh, on the right-hand side uh, would have been the uh, massive flooding uh, that followed a prolonged heavy rain event during the last week of June of 2005. Uh, that, those rain totals were also extraordinarily extraordinary, uh, generally six to 12 inches in our region and some places had over uh, 15 inches in, in uh, Schuylkill County. So that would be Delaware Water Gap, of course. And then uh, continuing to pivot, uh, more flooding in Delaware Water Gap, which I believe um, uh, was a, uh, uh, an October uh, 2005 event. Uh, so there were, there were several, there are actually a total of four historic uh, rain events um, in between 2004 and 2006 that caused three of the four anyway, widespread flooding along the Delaware River. And, and certainly, and most of us would remember that, Shawnee being flooded a number of times. But it was just the fact that it happened so often uh, during that phase. Again, uh, Ivan, which made sense, remnants of a tropical storm are our biggest flood producing events. Uh, but then June 2005 uh, was, was a different setup, a stalled frontal boundary along the East Coast, but days and days and days of rain, uh, more than a week's worth. Um, October of 2005 um, was also a tropical uh, remnant storm that dropped eight to 10 inches of rain. And then we also had another event uh, in the spring uh, of, the, of the following year. We just had incredible amounts of rain and that really boosted the rainfall stats. And we saw pictures like these in the Pocono record. Um, and, and, and sadly, folks having to deal with flooding over and over and over again. And I think between 2004 and 2006, uh, we began to hear more about uh, climate change relative to rainfall uh, because of our experiences, weather is visceral. And to that end, the stat I wanted to mention is that compared to the mid 20th century, uh, Strasbourg in particular, the average rainfall, if you looked at based on a 30 year period from 1931 to 1960. And that was the first data I saw as a kid. Um, and, and the averages that were known, we averaged about 48 inches of precipitation, rain, snow, sleet, uh, the whole gamut over the course of a year. 
the new numbers for the, the latest 30 year period, 1991 through 2020 for Stroudsburg, East Stroudsburg, 53 and a half inches. We average more than five inches or we receive an average of five inches more precipitation um, now than we did in the mid uh, 20th century and then probably even farther back than that. We just don't have good data uh, or as a, a thorough data for that portion. Uh, so clearly it's not our imagination that it's getting wetter, but numerous studies have shown uh, in the Northeast in particular, more so than any other part of the country, the average number of um, uh, one day heavy rain events, uh, or the percentage has increased 55% and 42% in the Midwest. And so the top 1% of all rainfalls which for our region might be, you know, who knows, two or three inch rain events. Uh, it would be different, obviously, for different areas. Um, you know, that number has increased uh, uh, dramatically. Um, and that, that's significant because then your, your risk of, of flooding uh, goes up. And we've certainly seen that, particularly in the last quarter century, far more so than in, say, between the... Uh, twin hurricanes of 1955 um, uh, into the 1980s. And, and, and back in the day, uh, most of our floods were, whether it was the hurricanes, Connie and Diane in 1955, Agnes in 1972, Eloise in 1975. There was a, a very rainy July in 1969, around the time uh, man walked on the moon and some ascribed our crazy weather that month to, to that. Uh, but you know, but, you know, maybe once a decade, twice at most, but now major floods seem to occur almost routinely, uh, largely from uh, tropical storms, probably more of them coming farther north from the Gulf. Uh, again, years ago, if we were impacted by the remnants of a hurricane, invariably it was an East Coast hurricane, uh, whether it was Connie and Diane in 1955 uh, or... Uh, uh, storms uh, in the early 1960s, and then there was a bit of a lull in hurricane activity, but then we had, uh, uh, in 1998, Floyd uh, brought tremendous amounts of rain. Uh, but one thing I've noticed in the 21st century is that the majority of our uh, uh, tropical storm and tropical cyclone or post-tropical cyclone uh, floods have been from storms originating in the Gulf of Mexico and coming in from the West. And that poses a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an added threat, uh, again, a one-two punch, whereas there was a time when the jet stream tended to steer storms uh, near and off the East Coast, but fewer dips in the jet stream, we'll say, uh, uh, it was less likely for a Southern system to also be a problem. Uh, more picture taking, uh, just to, uh, to get us in the mood. I took these photos. Um, uh, uh, at, ideally at exactly the same spot, um, uh, just uh, uh, to the north of East Stroudsburg uh, with the, uh, uh, our, my, one of my favorite settings, a pond um, or lake. Uh, but this is where I've, I've tried to keep, a, uh, keep up with a change of uh, seasons. So that, it's always just nice to uh, see that. Uh, pretty soon we'll be in the flaming foliage season. And again, there's a little bit of a climate change aspect to this. It's not our imagination that the colors seem to be coming later. Uh, the greens seem to be uh, lasting longer. Uh, and that's because the seasons have shifted ever so slightly, uh, but perceptibly. Um, and by that, I mean it, uh, autumn weather tends to stay warmer longer, later first frost uh, compared to say the mid 20th century, uh, the, six, the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So our first frost, our first 32 degrees are colder and, and the weather conducive to uh, fall color changes uh, with the autumns on average being a little bit warmer, the colors are coming later. We, we tend to, we can see greenery uh, sometimes even into early November, which is a little strange. Uh, I remember um, again, as a kid, it was normal to see many of the colors uh, in full uh, vivid uh, display by the 1st of October. Uh, that is less and less uh, likely uh, these days. But either way, we get our foliage season. Now, of course, weather, that being rainfall and temperature, sunshine versus cloudy days, 
uh, will will play a role in the, in the color intensity. And without going to too great detail, ideally we want clear, sunny days, crisp nights, not too much cloud cover, enough rain to keep the leaves on the trees, um, but not too much rain and wind to bring them down early. So those are some things that we'll be looking at. Uh, my many trips back and forth on Interstate 80 look like this. Uh, another very prominent feature of our weather in the Poconos, but in the ridge and or valley and ridge uh, uh, topography that we have uh, would be, of course, uh, valley fog. Uh, river valley fog is even more dramatic, but valley fog simply because you get uh, some interesting cooling that occurs in the pockets below the ridges. And while the ridge tops would be and the mountains and the Pocono Plateau clearly much cooler during the day at a higher elevation, we all know that. Um, but at nighttime, cold air drains into these narrow valleys, and that can include the Stroudsburgs. And at times, historically, we've had temperatures as colder, colder in Stroudsburg than at Toby Hanna on a clear, calm morning. And we also tend to be foggy for the same reason. Uh, there are three ways to get fog. Uh, one, of course, is to bring in moisture. Another would be to cool moist air and mix warm and cold. But a third way is to have a dry atmosphere, but get strong cooling, uh, call it radiational cooling because of the terrain. And I've driven in, a, in and out of this uh, scene many, many, many times, whether it was going back and forth to Penn State or back and forth to Ohio. Uh, some odds and ends here to, to steer us um, uh, to the final portion, the severe weather portion. Uh, this is a, probably the earliest tornado damage in a picture. I could find uh, uh, outside of a newspaper anyway. And this is the Portland tornado. I called it my weather book uh, in 2002, the Pennsylvania weather book. And, and 10 years earlier, uh, the po Pocono weather history uh, they put together. Um, this is the, the old covered bridge that had withstood storm after storm after storm and flood after flood after flood in the 1800s, um, you know, built in, in the mid 1800s but it did not withstand uh, the uh, ravages, at least up high, of, of a 1929 tornado. Obviously, it, it didn't make it through the 1955 flood, and that was the end of uh, one of the longest, if not longest, spans of, of uh, covered bridge, right? In, in our, but that's what it looked like. Um, and of course, this is close to where you can cross or stand in the middle of the river, as I've done on that walkway over to New Jersey uh, in Portland. Just to be clear, this is Portland. Uh, but this was the only instance of a killer tornado in our immediate region. The deaths occurred on the New Jersey side of the Delaware River. Uh, this probably would have been an EF2 or EF3 tornado had we been able to, to uh, take note. Now, as we mentioned, as a point of safety, um, and we've had our share of tragedies uh, locally, um, sadly more folks are, are hurt and uh, killed on average uh, lose long-term by lightning sometimes, in, in some years anyway, than by tornadoes. And in part because you don't always see it coming. Um, and in part, sometimes I think all of us, including me, uh, are a little too cavalier about walking the dog, the storm we think has passed. But this picture illustrates the branching nature of a lightning stroke, multiple branches from a couple to maybe a couple of dozen. But the key here is lightning travels five to 10 miles from a a thunderstorm, especially a bolt from the blue, from the top of a thunderstorm. Uh, so keep this image in mind. You know, if you're hearing thunder, there is lightning, and you're close enough to be struck by lightning. Now, of course, a lot of lightning uh, is cloud to cloud. That's not the problem. It's uh, the uh, cloud to ground strikes that are potentially, that are dangerous, and all can be dangerous, even in a run-of-the-mill thunderstorm. But this is one of my, this picture, courtesy of the Pocono Record, I should add, is one of the best I've ever seen uh, in terms of showing the branching nature as, as, the, uh, as the electrons flow toward the ground and meet up with a ground uh, surge, which tends to follow buildings and metal fences and all the things we, and trees that we try to stay away from. Um, but again, if you hear and instill in your children too, and uh, if, it's, it's, if it's rumbling, it's already time to come in. I think we do a way better job uh, I remember Little League games that continued with thunder uh, when I was playing ball in, in, in East Stroudsburg uh, by Dansbury Park. Uh, nowadays, the rules are, and same for football games, uh, you know, play stops uh, for a half hour clearance. One of the most awesome pictures uh, that you'll ever see, let alone here, 
Uh, this is the PoconoRecord.com. Um, most anyone who was here uh, 12, 11, 12 years ago will remember the, as I call it, and wrote about the Cherry Valley tornado. Uh, this is a full blown Midwestern style uh, wedge tornado that we almost never see here. The, the Portland tornado of 1929 uh, that, that uh, crossed uh, and, and damaged the covered bridge and then uh, took lives in New Jersey undoubtedly looked like this. And from um, uh, the, the daily record uh, uh, back then, the description, uh, this is what happened. So we get these, uh, in, uh, but rare. Rare because the terrain is not supportive of a, uh, a funnel of this nature uh, maintaining contact with the ground or for very long. But you have a, just enough space and just the right conditions uh, in, in, in an area uh, come together. Maybe this comes together over a ridge top and you don't get a uh, funnel that makes it to the ground or it's fleeting. But we had classic conditions, but we've had many times, many, many, many times, uh, classic weather conditions for severe weather and, and tornadoes, and it does not materialize, certainly nothing like this. This was a, at least an EF2 tornado uh, that, came, that came right through Cherry Valley, uh, several injuries on, on Blakesley Road. I remember visiting home about a week or two afterwards and absolutely could not believe that this kind of tornado damage, I would ever see that uh, in Northeastern Pennsylvania and in the Pocono region. It is just so difficult for storm to find an open space uh, for this to happen. Small tornadoes, yes. And yes, they have been increasing in number uh, in Pennsylvania, especially in the Southeast uh, portion of the state and to a lesser extent in the Northeast. And that is a climate change discussion in a nutshell higher heat and humidity, which we can document. We have higher temperatures, higher dew points, or high, more moisture in the air. So we have a couple of, of ingredients that when we get requisite or necessary wind shear, turning of the winds, uh, which we've always had, that's not climate change, but, but when, when the requisite uh, change in direction and speed and winds vertically has more fuel to work with on average, higher temperatures, higher uh, water temperatures, Gulf and Atlantic, in other words, more fuel, you're more likely to have not a wedge tornado, but you're more likely to see tornadoes. Uh, Ida just spun off uh, seven tornadoes in Pennsylvania, which appears to be a record for uh, the passage of a tropical storm all south of the Lehigh Valley or near and south of the Lehigh Valley. And uh, on July 29th of this year, which is the anniversary of this, of the Cherry Valley storm, I believe if my memory is correct, in 2009, July 29th of 2021, a record July outbreak of what appears to have been 13 tornadoes, not tropical, but playing off tropical moisture and a strong disturbance crossing Pennsylvania from Northwest to Southeast. So what do we look at uh, on radar? This, this, you know, because I think you hear talk about this fleetingly. Um, and I, I'm using an example that we just had uh, out here in Ohio this year uh, but because uh, I don't have a good uh, a classic picture of, of uh, radar that would catch your attention and trigger a tornado warning. We didn't have Doppler radar uh, before the 90s. And, and even then uh, it took a while to uh, refine tornado warnings. Keep in mind tornado warnings, um, uh, when I was growing up and, and well beyond that, relied on the siding of a funnel uh, or after a tornado already struck, which is obviously too late. But now we peer inside a thunderstorm using we call a uh, uh, storm relative velocity or the, a velocity mode, which depicts the motion of the air. And so we're looking for air that is turning, of course. Um, and then this looks like a mess, but if, if you think of this, by in this case, the National Weather Service site, I don't know if you can see my arrow, is down in the lower left. So red means air, or in this case, the raindrops, but air is moving away from radar, the radar site, uh, after uh, the beam bounces off the targets, being uh, rain drops or hail. Uh, green uh, means that um, you see the arrow that air is moving toward the radar site. All right, that's fine. Uh, there often are st strong outflows or gust, gust fronts, that wind that blasts ahead of a thunderstorm, and you'll get a big area of red and maybe a big area of green. But what catches your eye here, a formative tornado, you see red and green forming a couplet. 
So in that case, there has to be some kind of twisting action for air to be both air to air currents or flow moving past each other. And at some point here, we see red and green touching, uh, the air is, is actually coming together. That's an indication of, of moderate rotation. Now, the more familiar radar picture, or we call it reflectivity, of the very at the very same time would look like this. So notice here, uh, you know, with, with the, the formative tornado, you wouldn't really get too worked up about what you would just on radar alone. Yeah, you see a bit of a, a discrete cell here, a thunderstorm off by itself. So that means it's probably got a little better circulation potential, but there and and a little bit of an appendage here. You know, we look for, uh, out, especially out in the Midwest, we're less likely to see in Pennsylvania, but a bit of a, a twist or hook echo. Um, but so, but we saw, now in this case, red and green has nothing to do with direction of motion on Doppler radar. It is just the intensity of the rain. So the red cores would be heavy rain. But this this is the cell uh, that, that had spin to it. But when we were back on velocity mode, you saw red and green in other words, air moving toward and away from radar in a tight, uh, tightening couplet or coming together to form spin. So prior to Doppler radar, when all we had was reflectivity, in other words, raindrops reflecting uh, energy uh, back, you know, you may, you wouldn't see storms sometimes until they're, they were full blown. Doppler radar is, gives us that x-ray. Maybe it sees rotation before a storm ever reaches the ground even though maybe 90% never reached the ground, but that's some of the science to uh, uh, that. And, 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 and again, um, television meteorologists are using more of, of these two items, velocity mode, and this is the more traditional uh, reflectivity mode, in other words, how heavy it is raining uh, that you'll see on the air. I think that is it for the uh, screen share. It's probably a good time for me to let Amy jump in. And let's see if, if you have any questions as well. That was great, thank you. We do have some questions. Do you wanna keep your screen on? Or do you wanna stop the share, Ben? What's, what do you wanna do? Yeah. Okay, that works. Um, seeing all those snowy photos. It's something to look forward to. <laughs> it's really a couple of months. Gotta tell you, last, last winter was pretty brutal. Yeah, and, and, and it was a winter that was deceivingly so because it didn't start out that way. Uh, it was bookended uh, by, you know, yeah, we had a, a we, we did have a, a substantial mid-December snowfall that was a little overpredicted um, for our region, and uh, that was just a, a, as a refresher, uh, we wound up with a, a solid foot of snow, uh, 10 to 15 inches to be exact, and yet um, there was some disappointment because early forecasts, and this gets into uh, computer models, uh, had projected I believe the European model in particular, two feet of snow. And you may remember, uh, and then expectations go through the roof, which is the bane of meteorologists' existence. Uh, stuff gets passed around on social media, and we can't put the proper qualifiers, as in this is one model or one run of one model, uh, which is significant. However, other models may be showing, and we're showing less snow, but when something hits the realm of social media, everyone goes with the biggest numbers. And right. once they get passed around, we're trying to bat down rumors or at least uh, tamp down expectations until we get, oh, maybe 24 to 48 hours uh, within an event. Because sometimes what you see three or four days out works out perfectly. Sometimes it changes six or 12 hours after, uh, you know, as, as storms shift course a little bit and the, or the temperature rises or falls a degree or two, and suddenly snow is rain, rain is snow. Again, I've seen infinite variations of what can uh, cause that to change. So we uh, meteorologists, uh, especially in, in the east, but anywhere, forecasting snow is really, really challenging. Even right, I've seen, event. and I've noticed meteorologists now will say, they'll show the models, like this is the European model. You know, it takes the storm this way versus the, you know, so right. I, that, oh, they're and showing the, the models and that they don't agree with each other or they, they do agree with each other. So that's interesting. And, and that's, and that's the, the challenge because... Usually over time, what I've noticed, they will disagree maybe by hundreds of miles and multiple inches two to four days out. Mm -hmm. But then, then you see a kind of a meeting of the minds uh, or what we call a consensus forecast. And I think that's in general, unless as a meteorologist, and that's why forecasts can differ because 
two, two or three meteorologists may opt for different models based on preference, experience, gut feeling. Um, I, I liken it to in the medical profession, maybe uh, two doctors uh, may look at the same set of um, medical results and x-rays, but because of patients they've treated in the past, they may see a, catch a subtlety and, and, and think and, and lean one way or another until we you know, get additional data. Uh, you know, so, and we are, these are diagnostic equations that go into the computer models, but again, the data are changing, um, and the computer models are using wide grids, uh, spacing between a data points. So stuff happens between the cracks, uh, and then simply weather creates its own weather. It's evolving as it's happening. So, a, you know, uh, as a storm moves up the East coast and it's starting to churn out rain and snow, it's also, uh, condensation is releasing heat that may warm a layer of the atmosphere that you thought was gonna be uh, uh, all snow and suddenly it's raining and your snow totals crash. Or right. conversely, uh, uh, the air uh, cools a little bit faster in a layer that the computer models didn't expect and we expected snow to turn to rain and it keeps on snowing and there's an extra six inches. And again, I can cite thousands of examples, uh, a lot of heartburn. Um, <laughs> But, but I think the whole, the big, the big, in the big picture, don't believe what you read on the internet. Um, and we as meteorologists are, are not, uh, as, a, as a profession, you know, the goal is not, is actually to present models to show that there, there, are, there is a lot of uncertainty and there always is. Occasionally things all seem to line up in one direction. Uh, and, and forecasts, three-day forecasts are now as accurate as two-day forecasts were even a decade ago, four-day forecasts are as accurate as two-day forecasts were when I started. So, you know, we can statistically see the improvement, but our expectations, and I'm part of the general public as, as well as being a meteorologist, have gone higher and right. we're cranky when things don't work out. And we, uh, you know, we take it very personally um, also when, when, th when things uh, start to deviate and then you're sometimes playing catch up. Um, but, but also remember, uh, there's not one uniform forecast, but sometimes expectations are driven by social media, but that you miss the nuance and that's up to the individual uh, television or meteorologist or the AccuWeather meteorologist or you name it, uh, that sometimes gets lost in, 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 the, in, the, in the hype. Um, but if the best folks are clear cut in terms of, here's what we think, here are some of the uncertainties, several models, it's not a hedge, it's the fact there are, and again, when I started, we maybe had one model or two models, right. and the data was very rough, and the resolution wasn't so good, um, and I don't know how we knew anything that was going on, frankly, uh, back then, but we, we uh, a lot of it is also uh, in, in the hands of the, the person making the forecast, so you're applying your past experiences with a certain storm track, a familiar, familiarity, oh, I've seen this before, and I know that this might change or that, but that, again, that's, um, you know, that's, in, that's up to the individual uh, meteorologist. Good. Okay. So we have a bunch of questions. We'll get started. What are the origins of the terms El Nino and La Nina? And, and again, funny, uh, I heard a radio personality say, you know, how come we never heard of El Nino? Where did, you know, as in, as this was, or La Nina, this was an invented term. No, it just wasn't talked about. Uh, Peru uh, fishermen noticed the uh, uh, changes in their catch, the fisheries in South America, which was okay. a function of uh, whether uh, well, up, upwelling of cooler water uh, brings nutrients to the surface. Uh, and, and upwelling is, is associated with a uh, La Nina without getting too deep, but, but uh, literally. Uh, but the upwelling of cool water, which then pushes west, and that cooling is what we're calling La Nina off the coast of South America and often spreads farther north. And then we looked at the meteorology aspects of that, what that does to the jet stream, and the storm track. But fishermen for centuries uh, figured that out. Um, but it wasn't until, uh, and then conversely, uh, in an El Nino, that war warm water came uh, from west to east and essentially buried the cold surface water, pushed it down, fewer nutrients for the fish, and, and poor fishing seasons. And the fact that it tended to show up around Christmas time, an El Nino at least, uh, and El Nino, whether it's the little boy or the child, uh, for the Christ child, uh, based on uh, the history, that's the, the nomenclature. That's where it came from. Now, our scientific knowledge of, of El Nino 
or its counter, which is warm water pooling east and diminishing um, uh, uh, fishing uh, uh, opportunities, or at least uh, 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 that uh, versus uh, La Nina, actually starts in the early 20th century when Sir Gilbert Walker, I, I, I think, I don't know if he was, I believe Australian or, or the British uh, Meteorological Office, saw, caught a pressure change that goes on at, at by Tahiti uh, and between Tahiti and Darwin, Australia, a cyclic pattern every several years that initiates uh, the El Nino-La Nina cycle. So it actually was all tied together. The pressure swings uh, in one direction or another it has to do with whether cool water moves upwells and moves west or warm water sloshes east with huge implications for the fisheries, but also, as it turns out, substantial implications for the weather downstream, the jet stream, as it moves across North America. So those terms are centuries old. We just didn't know about them. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so another comment or well, question. Does everyone remember that the groundhog predicted six more weeks of winter and then that big storm began on February 2nd? Yeah, the, um, and, and groundhog is, is fun lore. Um, Punxsutawney Phil is actually not the only groundhog, but uh, he's the only one we care about. Um, uh, but I will say the, the the forecast numbers are not good. Somebody ran some uh, uh, scientific studies uh, not too long ago even, and, and the groundhog is basically the fl a flip of the coin. Um, but but the history, and I wrote about it, is fascinating because the... the, the uh, Again, it's a, it's a Pennsylvania thing, the uh, Pennsylvania Germans, uh, or, or uh, at that time no, called the Pennsylvania Dutch, uh, but Pennsylvania German uh, uh, culture, uh, but brought over the, uh, the tradition of Groundhog Day, uh, which was Candlemas Day uh, in, in medieval Europe. Uh, it's kind of a midpoint of winter and uh, with candles, and, but, but it, it, it eventually uh, got caught up in, in, in uh, American folklore uh, in a journal in, I'm uh, pretty sure it was in York, uh, who published uh, uh, the first uh, uh, idea of, of Groundhog Day uh, or, or, or the groundhog or any other, several other types of, of animals being prognosticators. But, but again, Pennsylvania being the seat of uh, discovery, the, the cultural origin, well, of course, going back into uh, uh, medieval uh, uh, Europe, uh, but in terms of popularization, uh, the credit goes to a Pennsylvania um, a journal, and uh, but it wasn't until 1886 that uh, uh, the editor of the newspaper, Clymer Frias, uh, in Punxsutawney, uh, began to take this to a to a new level. And now we don't have records for every year, but I think something like uh, 90 some percent of the winters. But but it graduated from an event, uh, a local event, to a public local event, to a national event, and then the multiple groundhogs that that uh, spend the rest of the year in, the, in a library hermetically sealed I guess uh, on the porch you know but the um, yes yeah, so, but but again it, you know lots of uh, um, uh, cool stuff that that that, that we uh, Pennsylvania claim credit to again meteorologically uh, there's nothing really to it to be honest with you and sometimes it, when it works we say aha the groundhog was right or worse uh, when it doesn't work, the groundhog was wrong. And you know, the groundhog's thinking, I didn't ask for this. All right. Is yeah. he taking heartburn medicine too? <laughs> oh, I, I'm sure. Uh, so, because, you know, why, why, why blame the groundhog for, and I see this all the time, uh, we blame the groundhog because the weather suddenly gets cold and snowy in February, and, which has, you know, has nothing to do with the groundhog or your friendly groundhog meteorologist or whoever. It's weather. Um, but but it's still fun. But the history, uh, which is what I like to write about, is what's the fascinating part. The origins, uh, going back centuries, it wasn't always a groundhog uh, at all, and, and it, it tied in with the superstition and other things. But then it, it became, as many things do, popularized and and and, and turns into a lot of fun um, every year on, on February second. And other states, some states have a, a instead of a groundhog, have a rattlesnake. Uh, as, as a weather prognosticator. It's gotten ridiculous, but, you know, it's it, it's a talking point, and uh, I think it gives us all a little levity. And, now, I'm, not, I'm not pulling a rattlesnake out of a hole. No, no, I would want to be the one to see what the rattlesnake is predicting. <laughs> well, as we talked about earlier, just the, the, the woolly bear, you know, whether it has... Another or... perfect example. So... Yeah, and, and in a nutshell there, the woolly bear is not a prognosticator either, but but has been popularized as one, 
uh, here in Ohio, the, the Woolly Bear Festival by a Cleveland meteorologist. But the thing is, I've talked to every naturalist I've talked to, I uh, said that, that, that the, uh, the, the bands are largely a reflection of current conditions, uh, not, they're not predictive. Um, you know, I think we, we get a sense of small orange bands, big black band in the middle, uh, it's going to be a rough winter. And of course, sometimes that happens to work out. But they've told me in the same season, you will see woolly bears that have small or large black bands. Smaller black band, more orange would mean a mild winter. So, but, you know, you can make anything work out, uh, certainly retrospectively. But, but naturalists tell me anyway that, you know, whether it's dry or warm or the environment that that particular woolly bear is subsisting in uh, or existing in has more to do with uh, how the, uh, the banding or maybe even antecedent conditions uh, a little bit earlier in the season. But, but of course, that, that and the groundhog, are, we have fun with it, as we okay, should. So switching gears from rattlesnakes and groundhogs, what factors determine whether precipitation falls as ice or as snow? Clearly the, uh, the temperature, but then the question is where. It's not the temperature at the ground. Now, the ground temperature may determine whether the snow or ice stick. I mean, you can have rain falling at sub-freezing temperatures and have the great January ice storm of 2005, uh, where rain, it's warm enough for rain, but then the rain hits surface temperatures in the 20s and you have a sheet of ice inches thick and a, and a, and a very bad situation. But particularly, I've noticed about three to 6,000 feet above the ground, uh, if you, you, ha you have to stay below freezing in that layer. If you're not uniformly below freezing, 32 or colder, and it's certainly above it, um, because often our warm layer that, that you know, we're, we're the, as, as my friend and colleague who I mentioned took some of those pictures from Cherry Valley and on 115, uh, you know, he and I both agree that we're the, the, we're the sleet capital of, uh, of, the, of the country, it seems, because we start a snow so often, and not just us, but Lehigh Valley um, and, and to Northwest New Jersey, the, the atmosphere at the surface is in the 20s. We're cold enough for accumulating snow. And then halfway or three quarters of a way into a storm, you hear the ping, ping, ping of ice pellets. And you're thinking it's still, and, and your outdoor temperature, maybe it started at 25 and it's still 28 degrees. And then I remember as a kid thinking, why is this happening? Why is my snowstorm and snow day being ruined? <laughs> um, which was, I think, how I, why I got into weather in the first place, uh, trying to figure out if we'd have a snow day. Um, but what happens is, we're, we're, remember, we're less than 100 miles from the Atlantic Ocean. So if the wind turns easterly and counterclockwise winds, low pressure, invariably means an east wind for a storm near the east coast or to our south and east, uh, that's going to interject uh, maritime air, uh, but not right necessarily at the ground as it would do in Long Island, for, uh, for example, where you get that instant change to rain or maybe it never it's an all rain event. But that warm layer is... is We'll say three to six thousand feet above the ground. Well, now the snow that's falling above that hits a layer of thirty-three to thirty-six degree temperatures, the maritime layer, we'll call it, and so the snow partially melts into sleet, fully melts into a liquid, or it's it's a mix, and and then the lowest three thousand feet, maybe it's still twenty-eight to thirty-two degrees, but it's what happened in that the layer just above the ground. Now you can extinguish that layer, if you get sufficient cooling, you counteract it, let's say if the air is vigorously rising in a big storm, and then you'll see these bouts where we go back and forth, especially in major storms, heavy snow for a while, then you turn over to sleet, and then suddenly it's snowing really hard, and okay, we're, the storm is back on, oh, now the precipitation lightens up and it's back to sleet or some kind of mix. The, the more vigorous um, uh, precipitation uh, also cools the air or cools that layer. So if you're right at freezing or just above freezing, maybe you knock it down a degree or two and you can sustain heavier snowflakes. And then the precipitation lightens up and temperature inches up a little bit, less cooling via evaporation. And it's back to 33 degrees in that key layer. We'll say, you know, we'll pretend it's uniform. Uh, and suddenly you're back to a wintry mix until May, until that maritime layer is, is replaced by more of a northwesterly on the backside of the storm where you're more apt to end as snow, but usually only briefly. And then you go to flurries as cold air wraps around, if you think of a counterclockwise wind, and a storm as it exits Long Island, now our winds are back to northwesterly and that, and that layer is eradicated. 
but you know, it's it's often and at least especially because of the proximity to the Atlantic Ocean, um, it's a tug of war. Um, it's very difficult to get an all snow event uh, in the Stroudsburgs in particular, but even to some extent on the plateau. The farther north and west you go, where you have higher elevation, some additional cooling, another 25 miles or more from the coast, of course, your your potential to stay all snow and maybe the mountains, as we say, even though it's not truly mountains, but the plateau gets two feet of snow and Stroudsburg has a foot of mixed precipitation. Seen that many, many times, much to my consternation growing up. Uh, that drove me uh, crazy. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you just drive up 611, you know, you start in Stroudsburg uh, and there's like a break at Scott Run and a, exactly. and a break at, you know, you can see it. And, and I we look at this all the time. The temperature drops about um, oh, two or three degrees per thousand feet on average. So, you know, Tannersville, you're maybe 800 to 1,000 feet as you get past there. Well, if you're sitting at 34 in Stroudsburg, now you're 32. And then you're 30 degrees at Scott Run and you're 28 at Toby Hanna. And that's a pretty, pretty typical spread for us. Mm -hmm. Now, you still can maintain all snow from top to bottom if the layer above you uh, is sufficiently cold. cold. Because we said it can still snow at 34 degrees. Now, you, however, you'll have some melting. So I've seen all snow events. I'm thinking... Um, as a kid, Thanksgiving in 1971, where we had a little uh, historic November snow. We had a little over a foot of snow in the Stroudsburgs, uh, canceled the Turkey Day game uh, back when we had the Turkey Day game mm -hmm. and, and, and our band practice and everything else. Uh, but Mount Pocono came in with two feet of snow, but we didn't change over. And I didn't understand that either. Well, what happened is we got up to 35 degrees during the final phase of the storm. Mount Pocono probably was in the upper 20s. So all the snow accumulated, whereas we lost uh, the last several hours of heavy snow. And on top of that, and this is another big factor, air moving upslope, Appalachian upslope flow. In other words, moist Atlantic air climbing uh, the Pocono Plateau will moisten further because of cooling. So you can wring out more snow strictly because of the, that lift. Or conversely, if you live downwind of the Pocono Plateau, and I'm thinking Southern and Monroe County, uh, the West End, uh, but but even south, southern and eastern Monroe County, I mean, it can still be snowing to beat the band on the plateau, and without with the storm still in 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 progress, but air is now moving on the backside of these storms uh, is now northwesterly. Well, it's coming down the mountain, so to speak, and that has a drying effect, and so the snow lightens up considerably. And it's the same storm, uh, but again, you may have uh, poor visibility at Mount Pocono. Some of it can be fog. And heavy snow and a much lighter snow, all other things being equal in the uh, southern and eastern Monroe. And that certainly affects total accumulations. These are the very difficult uh, uh, things to, to deal with in a, in a forecast. That's why I kept saying uh, these storms evolve, they produce their own weather, they produce their own energy and the amount of heat, and then you throw in topography. And it can be a nightmare uh, when you're on a borderline, uh, in a borderline event, uh, in whether it's Monroe County or as opposed to maybe a coastal area where you, uh, you know it's going to turn to rain after an hour. Uh, we, we have, and I've seen huge variations, we, we all have, just across the county. But uh, you may have the right idea, enough more, let's say 10 inches of rain, excuse me, one inch of rain is roughly 10 inches of snow. Assuming you've got that ratio figured out right, you might go for 10 inches of snow because your computer models, and by the way, that can change too, but your computer models tell you you're going to get an inch of liquid. Well, okay, but then you've got to factor in you know, mixed precipitation, melting, uh, and now you can see how s s all other things sort of being equal, but you throw in terrain and Mount Pocono gets a foot of snow and Strasbourg gets three inches. Um, or you max out sometimes. Uh, uh, I don't like the term overachieve, but that's the latest term, but where things just happen to, you're in that sweet spot and your temperature is just cold enough and, and you don't have other mitigating factors and you and hit the jackpot in a snow event. And that jackpot can vary varies from storm to storm. And it doesn't have to be just in the Poconos, obviously, but I'm citing our example. So yeah, we're in a tough spot. And, and again, all these nuances aren't important to our to you folks, to the viewing public. Uh, you know, it's just like, oh, you said we'd get six inches and we got three. Um, but realize that there are evolving circumstances long after uh, you've issued your 11 o'clock forecast or, or in the middle of a storm. Uh, the storm jogs 25 miles east or west can be a huge difference in, in the uh, storm totals. 
We've seen that. I believe in that, yeah. Time. So we have to give mm -hmm. a little bit of a, a range to snow forecast, but also we always say keep up with the latest forecast. A few things are written in stone. Uh, and it's not a hedge, it's simply there are that many variables, but there it's not, you can see everything 24 hours in advance and then say, okay, th th we'll call it a day. That will change internally, the internal dynamics of the system itself many times over before the conclusion of a storm. So is, is sleet and freezing rain, are those interchangeable or no, different? No, uh, good question. The sleet is, 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 is uh, solid. So when snow partially melts, or and maybe begins to to freeze in a uh, in a shallow layer of slightly above freezing air. You you because snow begins as an ice crystal to begin with, All right, So some of that snow melts, but you still have uh, some of that ice. Or the snow partially melts, you get some liquid, and that liquid freezes again in a colder layer below. You get ice pellets, soft ice pellets that um, don't accumulate very much, but it's more granular. But, and, and often you get sleet with snow. It's, it's usually, and actually I find that it's easier to drive on sleet sometimes than snow because you get, it's like, not quite like throwing rocks all down, but but you get some traction. Uh, some Very granular. The worst case scenario is you go completely over to rain, maybe in that warm layer, hypothetically three to 6,000 feet, it's 35 degrees. And we're still sitting at 28 as cold air often does, gets trapped in the Pocono valleys uh, or on the plateau. And then suddenly that liquid makes it all the way to the ground and encounters 28 or 30 degree surface temperatures and forms a glaze. And that glaze builds. And that's the most treacherous situation of all. Or worse, a road looks wet, um, especially when the precip is light, precipitation is light. Um, and, but because of the, uh, 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 the uh, well, we'll just say, you know, essentially you have a, a glaze forming uh, that you don't see. And that's what the term black ice, which is uh, because now you're not even expecting to encounter patches of ice. But but obviously you have to have 32 degrees or lower uh, and more likely at night than during the day, because during the day, even at 32, you're getting a little bit of uh, solar radiation through the clouds. So you have a little bit of an offset at night. You don't have that. Right. Um, I've heard some meteorologists present data that appears to indicate that climate change is not happening. What are your thoughts? on this? Well, a number of things we can say. Number one, climate change is always happening. Um, number two, climate change uh, can have a number of, um, uh, it, it's linked to many things and it's not, and not all uh, human activities. Uh, climate has been changing obviously from day one due to natural forces, solar activity, volcanoes, uh, internal cycles, uh, movement of the continents, on and on and on. So where the debate um, uh, rises today is, first of all, we can thoroughly document the rise in temperature, whether it be land or sea surface, is not in question. I work with the glaciologists at Ohio State where the rubber meets the road. The glaciers have melted, with a few exceptions, dramatically. Right. No one, you can't argue uh, when you see these, and I've seen the massive retreats of ice in equatorial regions, mountainous areas, uh, many, but not all areas of, of uh, Antarctica, although there's a mix there because sometimes warmer air, you get a little more snow, uh, but the Arctic sea ice has diminished dramatically. Um, you know, we, we can measure snow covers, good satellite measurements since the late 70s. You know, the documentation is, is uh, whether you can throw out a particular temperature site, and you should sometimes because it's maybe the temperature site is affected by urban development. But there are many, many, many uh, ways to measure climate change uh, or, and climate in general. So we, we have a, a wealth of data aside, and we can see that, you know, temperature, rainfall, uh, wildfires in the West, uh, uh, the intensity of rainfall events in the East, uh, larger snowstorms um, because, because of there's more moisture available. We can see all that, we can measure it, and we can, it's called attribution science. Uh, for example, climate scientists, are, I mean, it was determined that to, to have um, some of these extreme weather events, uh, in, all right, for example, Portland, Oregon, 116 degrees, Seattle, 108 degrees, 150 times more likely uh, caused by some form of human activity. In other words, you know, uh, with greenhouse gas warming versus a natural occurrence of those temperatures in that part of the country 
um, you know, we, based on proxy records that can take us back thousands of years. Um, so we're getting to the point where we, it's hard to make an argument that, um, that, that there isn't a, uh, uh, well, it's impossible. You cannot make an argument that climate isn't changing. Of course, you could say climate is, has always changed. And of course, some of it is natural variability. The, the difficult part is how much is or isn't related to, we'll say what we put in the atmosphere, fossil fuel emissions, coal, gas, oil burning uh, for electricity, energy, industrial processes. The simple physics is these are heat trapping gases. They've increased exponentially uh, concurrent with the rise in temperature uh, and, and a slightly warm environment is a in some parts, of, uh, if you have the right weather conditions, has more moisture content, heavier rain, and so on. Um, it's you know we can circle the wagons, but you know, it's, and when you look at the wildfire seasons that are getting longer, more severe in the West, sure we've had drought in the past, um, and and uh, but we, you know that's driven to a large extent by temperature, higher temperatures. Um, yeah, I mean the data. Uh, there's really no arguing against that. You can argue how much uh, of a human imprint uh, there is because the climate is vast. The percentage of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is relatively tiny compared to other gases. Uh, you can make some valid points, but you know when you step back and look at the sheer volume of data, um, you have to at least uh, consider uh, this. And, and I take it a step further when I give uh, presentations and I've heard from uh, uh, this includes uh, U.S. military and emergency planners. They don't have the luxury of, well, it's only a 5% chance or a 100-year flood. They have to plan for worst-case scenarios uh, and have, uh, and they have to take seriously, uh, and they don't have time for, for debates uh, because lives are, can be at stake. Uh, missions can be at stake. If you're an emergency planner, you have to decide where the floodplain is, how often, you know, we've seen how many times we read, this is the umpteenth 100 year flood. And of course that's a misnomer because every year there's a one in 100 chance of a 100 year flood. But then maybe our data are based on a drier climate too. You know, there's no question we're having, and again, all this is, is well documented in terms of the, the sheer numbers, uh, whether it's rainfall or flash floods. And we've all seen that if, uh, certainly in our part of the country uh, in recent years. Um, so there's all of this is part and parcel. It's hard to to, to sort things out. Attribution science is it, it can get a little iffy. There's always subjectivity, you know, given all of those uncertainties. But you know, we shouldn't. Um, it's it's scientists, uh, the vast majority, not all, uh, feel fairly certain that that. Uh, and it's easy. And I make this very simple uh, exam. Give the simple example. Because I've heard, well, we, you know, we're 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 too small to have an impact on climate. Well, th uh, the the majority of uh, summer rainfall in the Midwest comes from thunderstorms, and much of that, uh, especially the big complexes and the derechos, develop over the Corn Belt. So agriculture begets heavier rain, literally corn sweat transpiration or evapotranspiration is moisture that feeds the thunderstorms. So simply agriculture, agricultural processes, forgetting everything else, which as we grow crops, we impact the weather regionally. And, and so there's no question that whatever we do, we're, we're impacting. How much, you know, we can, we can uh, debate a little bit, but then if you're an emergency planner, uh, emergency management agency, or, or, uh, or any number of, um, uh, uh, folks who have to deal with this stuff, you can't really argue details. You look at frequencies, and, and but the fact that even if it's a small risk, you can't tolerate risk. Uh, some people, some people or agencies can, some some cannot. Um, and interestingly, and I, I did an op-ed for the New York Times about a decade ago called Ben Franklin on global warming. The same debate was happening among our amongst our founding fathers that. We were changing the climate of early America. Wow! And and it was vociferous, at times bitter. You had on one side a Noah Webster of Webster's Dictionary fame. You had other uh, leading uh, academics, uh, university presidents. Uh, you had uh, major figures like Thomas Jefferson weighing in on climate change. In other words, the weather isn't what it used to be, to put it 
simply, or the, the winters were less severe. They were aware of climate change, of course, uh, without the good record keeping. That's why Thomas Jefferson wanted a, a weather station in every county. The forerunner of the of the of the, of the volunteer, which I, which I am one, a volunteer weather observers that report to NOAA, uh, and that weather station, which in my case was at my parents' house for decades, and and now a colleague. Um, after my parents passed away, has taken over that weather station. That's the data you see in the Pocono record. But we have a continuous data set of high, low temperature, snowfall, rainfall. Uh, that's that was Thomas Jefferson's idea. Oh wow, uh, I did not know that. And but but the the upshot is, um, but the no one knew from carbon dioxide in 1780. So what do you think they blamed uh, climate change on, and and which is still to some extent true today? Land use. So. Uh, crop cultivation and clearing of forests were blamed for milder winters, more extreme weather, you know, all the same things we're hearing today, except it wasn't over greenhouse gases. And, and even today, um, land use is, you know, again, we talk about greenhouse gases, but land use is a big deal. Deforestation is, plays a huge role in carbon storage, for example, the Amazon rainforest. Uh, you know, again, these are all, all these are hour long topics amongst you know, among themselves. But, but anyway, th this is not the first time we've had this debate. Okay, looks like we have one more question. I moved here from the Midwest, and when a tornado warning is issued, I grab my family, pet, and some essential stuff and head for the basement. My friends think that's an overreaction. What is your recommendation? Uh, that's a great question uh, because we've had a, a, a an uptick in tornadoes uh, in recent years. Um, it was a rare event when I was growing up in the Poconos, and suddenly, uh, you know, so many years we've had uh, uh, the past few decades. Uh, in fact, in 2019, we had 34 tornadoes in the state. We've had at least two dozen this year. Uh, and clearly we're getting more tornado warnings. We're also getting more tornado warnings because Doppler radar didn't exist back uh, that many years right, ago. And right. so we're getting warnings for storms that not, are not necessarily tornadoes, but as we showed you in those pictures, formative rotation. Really good question. The odds of a tornado coming to, touching down and causing physical damage in our region is, is very low, but it's certainly not zero, Cherry Valley storm. Uh, Wilkesbury. That's for promised land. Remember promised promised land. land. Right. 2010, I believe. Um, and also, in, um, there's another event I have to, uh, late night, it might have been 1998, where tornadoes raked uh, portions of Pike and Wayne. Uh, Wilkesbury tornado in 2018. Uh, there have been enough of these events uh, that if a tornado warning is issued, even though there's a very low probability that the funnel will reach the ground, especially here. Now, it's a little different in the Midwest. I think you're you're really taking a chance uh, if you're not paying close attention. We tend to be a little you know, cavalier, no pun intended, about the tornado warnings in, in the Stroudsburgs. Um, but that said, you know, any, you know, one of these situations or like the Portland tornado, 1929, Cherry Valley, occasionally a storm does make it to the ground and does damage. And while it's a very low chance, you're still, yes, you are better off going to the basement or lowest floor uh, away from uh, uh, outer walls, but even a strong thunderstorm, I point this out all the time, without any rotation can do similar damage. We've seen thunderstorms peel roofs off. We've thund seen thunderstorms drop trees on cars through windows. So the rules are kind of the same. And so a severe thunderstorm that's non-tornadic, it's still a good idea to be away from exterior walls, away from windows, away from windows also because of lightning, away from plumbing because of lightning. Um, if it's a particularly severe storm or that merits a tornado warning, yes, the basement or lowest floor. Um, you know, sure, you're at higher risk in where I'm at in Ohio or in Tennessee or, or worse in other parts of the country, um, but we have, they're issued for a reason. And, um, and tornado deaths have dropped dramatically uh, with the advent of, of uh, better warnings, timely warnings, Doppler radar, uh, lead times that are uh, give you much more time to you know, take, take cover. You've got your phone now with all the warnings. You can see the warning boxes. You, the old days, you'd had to be home watching TV or have the radio on in the car. Well, now you're going to know immediately when there's a weather alert. And yes, so we, we do take these seriously. And we've had just with Ida, uh, 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 September 1st, we had damaging tornadoes in southeastern Pennsylvania. Look at Malika Hill, New Jersey, and EF3. Uh, many homes were leveled. 
Um, who's to say less likely maybe, but one of these days, uh, sadly, something could like that or a recurrence of a Cherry Valley wedge tornado could happen here. Uh, a little less likely on a ridge, but we've, I've documented tornadoes on the Pocono Plateau. Um, so yeah, take, take all a uh, warning seriously and don't get too into the weeds over de uh, risks. Right. Because technically it does exist. Very good. Well, we have another question. So what do you protect, predict for this year? Uh, tough call. We're La Nina winter would suggest a winter uh, that's relatively mild with one cold or one cold snowy period, which historically with these La Nina winters, last year was essentially the month of February. It could also come in mid-January. Uh, there's a bit of a, what we call a course correction that cycles, and there, there's more to it than La Nina. Uh, there, there, are, there are tropical uh, cycles and other things, but so it's rare that you get a winter that, that's the same from start to finish. Even cold snowy winters may have one month that's that's mild and, and, and has a, a, a thaw in it or two or three. Um, so one would think uh, best guess would be a winter somewhat like last winter, um, where generally uh, most of the months have slightly below normal snowfall. But the wild card, as we said at the very beginning, is not the Pacific, but the Atlantic Ocean. If you get a big blocking Greenland high, as we call it in the business, uh, suddenly the jet stream that flows more west to east across the lakes and New England buckles across the Midwest down to the mid-Atlantic states. And next thing you know, we're, we can have a couple of good snows and, and the cold air can kind of cool over us. Um, so, you know, I don't expect, unless it, if it's not, unless it's a really strong El Nino or La Nina, those winters tend to start warm and stay warm. Probably a variable winter, but leaning on the milder side, but still plenty of opportunities to shovel snow. Um, tropical cyclones, you know, we're up to 14 named storms. We have one that could become a tropical storm off of North Carolina in the next couple of days. So potentially, although the risk goes down in October, uh, we could get another uh, uh, cyclone uh, or post-tropical cyclone bringing heavy rain to the, to the region, uh, whether it's late September or in October. In fact, more than likely, we probably will have one or more events. So we're, we're just barely past peak hurricane season, so one of those in the fall. But in general, I, I would expect a warmer than average fall. Now, there will should be a pattern change. The last week of September uh, turned toward cooler air based on uh, what I'm seeing anyway in the long-range models, and some of that is just the but clearly we're having a mild September. We've had a warm summer. And I'll leave you the, uh, one other final note that three times in the last three summers prior to this summer, we set a new record for highest average uh, overnight temperatures during the summer months, be it July or August, with records going back to 1910. Um, we broke a, a record that, it, that was first set in 1949, then in 2010. We beat it three times in three consecutive summers. The nights are getting warmer. That's a reflection of higher humidity. Uh, uh, and that would that suggests more often we have a southerly flow, keep it simple. Um, and so the nights are getting warmer. That's more heat stress on all of us, more accumulated heat, our bodies, our homes. Uh, this is, you know, climate change. Sometimes we get, you know, what's a degree here, two degrees there. You know, true, except that what that means is, um, you know, less cooling at night. You know, we focus sometimes on daytime heating, less cooling at night. And Pennsylvania had the second highest, uh, a second warmest uh, uh, a pattern of, of, of nighttime low temperatures collectively as a state with records back to 1895. The upshot again, nights are getting warmer. Uh, and I think we've subtly noticed that. And that's direct reflection of, of higher humidity. So you get less cooling at night because moisture. Uh, is a greenhouse gas. In other words, it's a heat trapping gas, that being water vapor. Good. Thank you. Just check over here. I think that's all the questions. Okay. I want to thank you very much. I certainly, uh, I've always appreciated meteorologists, and I think it is a very, very hard job to, to predict and, and put, put, you know, things out there. Um, but I certainly appreciate it even more with your talk tonight. I never really thought about the Atlantic Ocean and, and just our area, how different it is, just even within Monroe County. And, and like you said, you go up 611 and that, aside from wanting to know when it was going to snow enough to get out of school, 
Um, even though my parents were teachers, that wasn't a, a popular sentiment in the house. But all, although, uh, uh, you know, 611 was a climate lab. Once I got my driver's license, boy, I had a field day, literally. Oh, taking sure. the other instruments up and down the mountain, up to Big Pocono. And then I could appreciate what I, instead of just reading about it in the newspaper, uh, I could live it. I could drive through these changes. And I'll leave you with one quick one minute uh, story because I think it's important because it ties in to your work and with the Historical Association. Um, when I was a kid, my dad being, uh, some of you may know, a longtime professor, English professor, uh, at, e at uh, ESSC, then ESU, um, for decades. And so I would hang out sometimes at the old Kemp Library looking at microfilms, and I read about a gentleman um, whose name would pop up in the early, uh, Monroe earlier Monroe County newspapers, we'll say a century ago, when there was a big weather event. He clearly was a weather geek like me. Um, before the days of good record keeping, his name was Luther Hoffman. Uh, he was a local historian. Uh, wrote a book on Middle Smithfield, and then, uh, but he would he would occasionally they would turn to him as as one of the um, uh, knowledgeable residents when there was some big snow. In fact, it was April, I think, of 1928, and he was able to say, well, back in 1857, whether it was his record or it would turn out his family records. So that was interesting in of itself, and he became part of my earliest notes for future weather history book. So what happens when I'm in Uh, and she uh, and a family friend of the, the Huffman, Huffman family. N none of this connected with me at first. And, and they were uh, doing a visit and uh, my friend Tom was tagging along. So I went with him. Uh, I think maybe we were helping, might have bring some supplies or who knows what uh, at the time or just. Uh, so I wind up at the Huffman family home, still not connecting the, the uh, that this is who I read about in the newspaper. And then um, for whatever reason that I'll never know, I was hanging around a box. Uh, it might've been a bookshelf. Uh, I don't remember the exact details. And again, for whatever reason, I pull out a notebook. And of course I saw his, uh, then I made the connection because I saw his uh, Middle Smithfield uh, or Smithfield history. I can't Smithfield, remember which, right. Right, which you have. And I've looked at, and suddenly I come upon the very diary that he, um, that had the stuff that would appear in random bits and pieces in the early 20th century uh, newspapers. And, and then only years later, and of course, I, I'm, I thought this was, this was a great discovery. I photocopied the notes. They became part of the weather book. Fine. But then I thought back later, as you get older, you get reflective. Of all the homes in Stroudsburg and East Stroudsburg, what are the odds that I wind up in that one home of the one person who had, who was a historian, who who very strongly want to preserve the rich history of the Stroudsburgs and especially Smithfield Township. Um, and I could have not found that notebook. Right. It's not, it's not like the family said, here's, here's something you'd be interested in. So only in, in hindsight, it was like there was some kind of connection to that, which became the nucleus of, or dr drove me to go ahead and document uh, his work and, and other historians and farmers who were the early weather observers uh, in the 1800s via the, uh, through the Smithsonian Institution uh, and other diaries and journals. But I thought, you know, that, you know, there wasn't web or internet, so that stuff was long gone. No one would see it. Well, I could, uh, you know, bring it, give it the light of day and, and move this, move the storylines forward. So the meticulous records he and others kept, um, you know, are, are still with us. And That's so I feel, I feel a compulsion to, uh, to carry on for as long as I can anyway, uh, the local history. Well, that's wonderful. We appreciate it. You know, maybe someday there's going to be a young Monroe County, uh, a kid that looks down and sees your book, and then you've you've passed, you've moved it forward even further. So well, he'd probably see an e-text these days. <laughs> um, but 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 absolutely, oh. and and who knows? There are so if there, and I've heard occasionally from uh, weather spotters uh, and others who have who have some. You know, there are a lot of shared interests, and it's easy to find me. By the way, I should add, very easy to find me on Facebook, Benjamin Gelber. Um, so if something we talked about interests you, you've got a, a great historical picture, whatever, please reach out. Uh, again, it's very easy to find uh, folks these days and just go to Benjamin Gelber on Facebook, I guess would be the quickest uh, link. Great. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for spending the evening with us and sharing all your knowledge and stories. I know I, I learned a lot, that's for sure. 
Thank, thank you, Amy, very much. I appreciate uh, your work and that of your colleagues and preserving all of, not just the weather history, but all of the history, which is, is just, you know, we are very lucky to be in Monroe County. Well, if it happens in Monroe County, or I guess if it falls in Monroe County, we're going to document it, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ben. And thank all right. you all for joining us tonight. Have a great evening.